So my name is Dr. Karen Crozer, and my home college is LA Mission College. And I am so excited today to finish up the series. And some of you have done such a wonderful job coming to each of these presentations. I know it's a very, very busy time, a lot of competing priorities. So I'm always so grateful uh, for taking the time out of your day to be here with me. And I hope that this time is useful to you. And hopefully each of you will learn something um, that's helpful. Okay. So today we're gonna to be focusing on accessible video, which is something that's become so important in our highly virtual COVID world where we can't communicate face-to-face -face with our students safely anymore. And so video is an amazing way to communicate, but it also takes special care to make those ways that we reach out through video accessible. So hopefully today will be really helpful and you'll feel excited and energized over the winter break to work on some of your videos. Eugene, I will be providing the link for the recording. Um, most likely I'll give it to our DE coordinator, Alibara, and he'll go ahead and put it um, in the LACCD uh, distance education module. Um, but you can also email me afterwards if you want and I can give it to you directly. Okay, so for now, um, I think some of you know me, you've come to uh, some, of the other, uh, vi some of the other trainings that we've done, and thank you for that. But for those of you who may be new, welcome. My name is Dr. Karen Crozer, like I said, and here at Mission College, I'm a distance education specialist during COVID, and I'm also an associate professor of English. And I'm very grateful for the support of my home college's DSPNS office. Um, all of them, but especially Adrian and Adam, who've been able to come to each of these despite having very busy schedules. And um, also for the support of uh, VP uh, Larry Resendez. And then I also want to thank my local distance education team who's been supporting me and helping me as I try to master some of these topics. So a uh, big shout out to our DE coordinator, Alibara, for his support, and also to my other DE specialist, Bomb Dad Sammy. If you have any questions after this training, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is crozerkj at laccd.edu. A lot of what you will see today is pulled from an at one course, which is just an acronym for online network of educators. They have a course that I highly recommend if you have time to take it called Creating Accessible Course Content. It's four weeks long. And I'll show you in a minute what some of the spring 2021 offerings are. And once you've completed their training satisfactorily, then you can train others, which is what I'm doing. And um, they share all this content under a Creative Commons attribution license that's made possible through funding from the California Community College Chancellor's Office. So really grateful for the time that that group has put into sort of organizing resources that I can then pull from for this presentation. Now, this is gonna be a very short overview of what could be a very uh, complex topic where you could do much longer of a deep dive and exploration. So what I would recommend is that you would consider if this is something you're excited about and passionate about, or it's just something you feel like you need more time to absorb some of the material, I really recommend the at one creating accessible course content class, four weeks long, completely online, $85. Um, I know at our campus, the professional growth committee reimburses half of that. Definitely was worth the money for me. I learned a lot. And you can see some of the dates here coming up in January, March, and April. Um, they do sell out quickly. So if you think that's something you might want to do, I would go ahead and look soon. You can just Google online network of educators and click on courses. Once you find that creating accessible course content class, then you can see what registration options are available. In this training, I have four main goals. We only have 90 minutes, which will go quickly, but the goals that I have are that we will learn to assess the production quality of a video, caption a video, curate video resources, and embed video in a Canvas page.
So I'm sure that I don't have to tell you that there are a lot of benefits of video. Video is a really wonderful way to provide material to our students. And we have both visual and auditory learners, as well as having in our brains, both an audio and a visual center. And video really hits on both of those for students. So it helps them really remember things and it can show them a complex idea, a concept or a process in sometimes a much more straightforward way than trying to write it out or use another medium. So we definitely want to use video. It's just important that we make it accessible for everybody. So you may remember, I think it was in week one or two, we talked about the poor principle. Um, I believe it's uh, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And when it comes to creating video, we're really gonna focus on two main act uh, main parts of that acronym. Um, is the video perceivable and is it understandable? So as we start thinking about creating accessible videos, um, because now we're not in the classroom anymore, we're not sure exactly when we will be in the classroom again. I think we're all hopeful that it'll be sooner rather than later, but we're at least one semester out, if not more. So as you're thinking about creating accessible videos that can be reused and viewed by multiple students over the course of, you know, maybe a couple of years, there's a couple of things that you want to think about. Um, the first thing is you want to write clear and cogent scripts. So if you are going to write a script in advance, you want it to be as clear as possible. You want it to be understandable. Um, you want to make sure your visuals are understandable. You want to make sure the audio is clear and you want to make sure that all videos have accurate captions. And these are sort of the basics when you're thinking about creating a video for your class. And it's really important that your videos have both visual and audio equivalents. Now that's kind of a mouthful, but basically what it means is that the law is mandating that all instructional material needs to be perceivable. So if what your video has is primarily visual, there needs to be an audible equivalent. Why? Uh, in case your student is blind or visually impaired, if it's audible, there needs to be a visual equivalent. And again, why? Because you may have a hearing impaired student. So you want to be able to reach all students at the same time, even those students who may have a visual or a, a hearing impairment. So a really important question is, is it audible, your video? And you may think, well, of course it does, it is, because often there is audio that accompanies videos that fulfills this requirement, but some videos are visual only, or there is only a background music track. So if you're in a place where you're able to close your eyes, obviously don't do so if you're driving or doing something where you can't, but what I'd like to do is play the first 20 seconds of a video for you, and I want you to just hear it. And in that way, we're kind of um, trying to put ourselves in, in the shoes of a student who is visually impaired or blind. So if everybody could take a second, if you can, and you're in a place you can, go ahead and close your eyes and I just want you to listen for the next 20 seconds. And I'm gonna play something. For those of you who were able to close your eyes, what was that video about? I think it was the mind reaching out in beyond itself, maybe being driven by a particular force within, um, uh, and maybe a, a little bit of edginess to uh, not wanting to go there. Um, 
that's what I took out of the music. Okay, great, great, great guess. Any other guesses for those of you who closed your eyes? Dark and foreboding. Yes, dark and foreboding. What else? It's beautiful music. Yeah, very beautiful music. Um, and I see Jesse wrote in the chat, all I could sense was tone. So yes, you were able to pick up something, but you weren't able to pick up the content of what was actually being shown. So now I want to re-show you this video um, with you watching. very moving video if you're a sighted learner but if you have vision um, impairments all you're going to hear is the music you're not going to be able to read the the screen cards so i just want to provide that to you as an example hold on sorry um, of how a vision impairment can affect the way somebody absorbs a video. So this video does have a lot of impact if you're sighted, but it would be completely imperceptible to the visually impaired. They might be able to say it was a sad video, it was the foreboding, but they wouldn't be able to tell you what any of the content was about. Um, and that's the problem, part of the problem that we're trying to address by thinking about how our video uh, works. Is it something that can be perceived by all students, because if it isn't, uh, then we have a problem. We're not reaching everyone. So there is a relevant law that has to do with this and it's called section 508. And what this law basically mandates is that all videos must be captioned before they are shown in the classroom. And this actually means both a traditional class or an online class. So I know there was a time before I knew this that in my face-to-face -face classes, if I didn't think any students had, you know, a hearing impairment, I, I would sometimes show things that didn't have captions. Well, that's actually uh, not supposed to happen. Um, legally, when we're in the classroom, in including if it's a face-to-face -face classroom, we're supposed to show captions every time. So the relevant portion of this law, section 508, you can see here on the slide, I'll go ahead and read it to you. All training and informational video and multimedia productions, which support the agency's mission, regardless of format, that contains speech or other audio information necessary for the comprehension of the content, shall be open or closed captioned. Now, in a minute, I'll explain to you the difference between open and closed captions. But the bottom line is, if you are showing a video, you have to have it captioned. Now, you might be thinking, well, I don't know of any, you know, hearing impaired student in my class. So why should I have to do it in a face-to-face -face classroom? But it's important to remember that students don't have to self-identify their disability to us as the faculty or the teacher. They don't have to come up and say, I have a hearing impairment at the beginning of class. So we can't assume that there's no one in there just because no one said that to us. So it's really important that when we create instructional videos for an online course, that we caption it, whether or not we have a hearing impaired student in our class. And it is the law. So as we think about video, we need to really think about best practices because poor video affects all of our students. So if our videos have garbled audio, a lot of background noise, or it's hard to hear and they're straining, that affects everybody. 
um, that basically increases the cognitive load on our students because now they're both trying to hear and trying to understand. All of the cognitive load in an ideal world should be just on them trying to learn. Um, and the same if there's a poor visual quality. If they can't really see what's going on and they're squinting to try to perceive what's happening in the video, that's a huge distraction and they're not going to retain and absorb the material in the same way. So if we're going to create videos, we need to really think in advance about both the audio and the visual. For the audio, we don't want the volume fluctuating up and down. We don't want inaudible words, startling background noises. You know, I have a five-year-old son. Sometimes he runs in and yells things like poop because he's five. But, you know, that's not good for a video. If that happens, I need to start over um, because that's very distracting for students. And in terms of the visual, if there's not enough lighting, students aren't going to be able to see what's going on. Um, and that includes how you light yourself if you're going to be the, a person in the video. So if you're going to create a video, it's really important to plan ahead. So you have to decide first, am I going to record myself, you know, actually the visual of me talking or am I just going to record my voice or something else? So if you're gonna record yourself video feed, you really wanna think about lighting and sound. So I know everyone's living situations are different. You may not have a room where you can close the door, but I think if you live with other people, it's really important to let them know when you're creating a video, um, have them help minimize sounds. If you can put pets in a different part of the house, um, that can really help. Um, make sure that you're well lit. And then the other thing you can do is create a video where you're not pictured, but you're talking. So a popular way to do that is called screencasting. And basically that's when the video would be your screen and you're talking over it. Now this can be really useful for Canvas because you can actually record your screen as you're clicking through the very steps your students will need to take for assignments and then you can talk over it. In that case, you don't have to worry about lighting because you're not displayed, it's just your screen, but you would still need to think about sound. So one of the things that can really help uh, with, with creating an accessible video is scripting. I am somebody who I don't love scripting because sometimes it makes me feel a little bit awkward or canned. But the truth is scripting can be very useful. Great video comes from careful planning with a clear focus on the instructional goals of the video. So if you write a script, it's going to help you stay on target. It's gonna help you stay very clear and lucid. And it's gonna help keep your video short and sweet. I know for me, if I don't have a script, I tend to ramble. A little bit of rambling can be okay, but if you have a script, you kind of eliminate that. The other nice thing about scripting is that you already have all the words there to effortless, effortlessly create captions. So the caption words are already there. Now you just need to upload them so that your video will have captions. You do not have to use scripting, but it is something to definitely consider. Here are a couple of tips for creating a high quality video. Now, unfortunately, there's not really enough time in this 90 minutes, especially with the focus being on accessibility, for me to go into great detail about how to set up your space, right? How to point your camera, how to set up your lighting. But here are a couple things that will just kind of put you ahead of the curve. The first thing is to use frontal lighting. Okay, so what that means is the light is in front of you coming onto your face so that your face is illuminated. Uh, probably you've had experience over the years, especially this year with people who attempt to zoom with backlighting. What that means is maybe they have a giant bay window behind them, maybe they have blinds behind them. And so what ends up being lit up is the window and they're kind of darkened. That's what you're trying to avoid. That's where you want light from the front. Now you can use a lamp, you can buy a ring light, you can get, I, in this room, um, I have lights. Uh, they kind of look like Flintstone lights. They're giant lights with umbrellas in front of them. 
uh, white umbrellas to sort of filter the light. It doesn't really matter how fancy or low grade you wanna go, just make sure the lighting's coming from the front. That way your students are going to be able to see you. You also wanna be aware of what's behind you. So in my case, I have a green screen. It's just a green sheet I think I got for 20 bucks on Amazon. And then I use the background replacement. But there's times when I, I you know, stream from a different room with my students. And, you know, you want to avoid, for instance, you know, streaming with a giant pile of laundry behind you. So that's going to be distracting. Or, you know, having a child or a partner running by in underwear behind you, right? Or having uh, inappropriate art where I'm not saying that kind of, you know, nude art might be appropriate in certain places, but probably not in the background of your Zoom video, right? So be aware of what's behind you um, and don't share uh, more than you want to. You know, your students don't need to see that you haven't washed your dishes in five days. So make sure that that's not your background. Third, you want to get a good microphone. Now there's all kinds. Personally, I don't know if you can see mine here. I'll move this a second. I'm using one that's kind of like a podcast mic on an arm. However, you don't have to go that fancy. My husband is uh, doing a podcast right now, so we're a little bit more tricked out in terms of our microphone than you, most people are. But you can also just get a USB microphone or a Bluetooth one that you can clip on um, for maybe 20 bucks on Amazon. And you, that's gonna help capture the sound so that people can hear you. And then I would just say, test your sound before recording, make sure that it's clear because again, we want the, everything you're saying needs to be perceivable to every one of your students. Fourth, be real. So it, at first, when I started making videos, I'm a perfectionist uh, at my core. I like to do everything perfectly, which is impossible. And part of what's a struggle for me with video is that I want every single part of my video to be perfect. But guess what? It's 2020. Nothing's perfect this year. And our students are looking to know that we're actually human beings experiencing this wild year with them. And we're not robots. So it's okay to be human. It's okay to make mistakes. That lets your students know you're just a normal person. So be real. That's okay. And it does get better. So over time, it won't be quite as weird to talk to your webcam or your camera. And then finally, keep it brief. Now, of course, for Zoom classes, we're gonna go a lot longer, but in terms of sort of a pre-made video that you're gonna upload, a general rule of thumb is to try to make it five minutes or less. Of course, if you have a, a different situation, do whatever's gonna work for you. But if you keep it five minutes or less, it's really gonna be focused. You're gonna really um, be able to sort of laser focus on your goals and your students are going to be less likely to lose focus. On this page, and I will um, add this presentation to the chat um, before we finish, but um, this, this teacher, Michelle Pekansky Brock, um, she did a lot of the research and sort of putting together of the humanizing class that is now taught by At One, the online network of educators, and also that our own district is doing. Um, a lot of her sort of work is foundational to those classes that we do today. That's where this infographic comes from. She has a ton of great web, uh, website resources. So if this is something you're interested in doing more on, because we can't do a full deep dive on this today, I completely recommend that you check out her resources. The other thing that I would recommend is considering taking a humanizing course. So I am finishing up the fourth week of At One's humanizing course, and I love it. It's been such a positive experience for me, and I've learned a lot. So similar to the accessible course class that I showed you earlier, it's four weeks, $85, and your, your campus may be able to reimburse part of that. Now, if you don't wanna pay the money or you would uh, prefer to do it through our district, the good news is that LACCD is offering a free humanizing course. It's uh, in January 4th through the 29th and fully online, of course, about 40 hours a week. So this is gonna be a, an option for you as well if you really wanna dig deep into this of how to use this video well, how to reach your students through video, how to make your students feel like you're there for them, even though you have all this technology between them. 
And then the final thing that I would say is that my local team here at Mission, uh, we're going to be doing a series in January. We haven't finalized all the dates, times, and topics, but we will soon. And it's going to be led by myself, the other DE specialist, Bomb Dad Sammy, and Ali Barra, our DE coordinator here on campus. So these will not be the full four-week course. Um, that If you want that, you should go through the district and enroll in the VRC. But if you're looking for just sort of bite-sized uh, training seminars like this one, where it's maybe 90 minutes or two hours max, um, check back in a couple weeks to see what we're offering in January. Okay, so let's say you've created this video. You had good lighting. You used a decent camera, you know, like you got an HD webcam or you used your smartphone. You know, you had the right lighting. You captured the right audio. Now you have to figure out where to save that video. Because the thing about videos that you may have realized just from living this year in this job is that videos take up a lot of space. And if you save all your videos on your home computer, very soon, often, your hard drive can become completely full. Now, you may have videos, some of them saved on Zoom. I know that I do. Um, the problem with that is that Zoom is not going to host those things forever. So you may, you know, in a year or two go, oh, I did the perfect video on this, go to look back and Zoom's already deleted it. So a uh, best practice is to really think about where you want to host your videos so that they don't disappear when you need them in the future. So once you've created a video, you need a host, a place where your video will be stored. So you could upload your, your video files or video directly into files in Canvas, but this may cause your page to load slowly. Um, now, the district did recently get Canvas Studio, which is going to be another option for hosting. Um, the only caveat is, um, as far the last that I heard, we only have a two-year contract with Canvas Studio. That may be extended. But if, for instance, it wasn't extended, then those videos might disappear when the contract's up. So you want to think about what might be the place where you want to host your videos so they never get deleted. And a lot of people use YouTube. That's my personal preference. But there's a couple great options for us as community college teachers that I'm going to walk you through right now. So the first and I would say probably most well-known hosting option is YouTube, because ever since the appearance of YouTube, it's changed all of our lives, I think. Um, and YouTube offers a variety of editing tools. Anyone can start an account. Um, it has a great sort of auto captioning feature, which isn't quite enough, but it'll get you started. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And one of the nice things is that through your account settings, you can make a video available only to your students. So when I first started working with YouTube, I was worried that everything I ever posted would be available to everyone in the whole world. That doesn't have to be the case. You can make a private link so that somebody only sees it if they have your link which is what I prefer to do with my instructional materials and my instructional videos. I don't necessarily want them for everybody, but I do want my students to be able to see them. So that's one option. Another option is 3C Media Solutions. So if you've never heard of this before, this is a service based on Palomar College that is funded by a grant, again, from the Chancellor's Office. And 3C Media will host and caption faculty made videos. And they also have some other interesting media collections. But the key word is that they only host and caption faculty made videos. So if you find another YouTube video that you think is great, but you did not uh, create it yourself, they're not going to caption it. Um, just looking here in chat, um, Joni, thanks for sharing that you got a microphone on Amazon. I think it does make a big difference. And then Karen G, yes, uh, students share the, could sh hypothetically share the link with other people, but uh, I guess I find personally that they're, they don't usually want to. Um, I guess I, personally, I haven't had a rush of people wanting to see my grammar videos, still waiting on the rush. So um, it is possible that somebody could see it, but I think it's probably going to be not too common for students to do that. A third hosting option is Vimeo. So this service is similar to YouTube. 
the one advantage is there are no commercials, which is nice. And you can still control the privacy settings. The downside is that the free version of Vimeo has a storage limit of 500 megabytes per week. So if you're making a lot of videos, you may exceed that, in which case they're going to want to charge you. Um, and there are different um, kind of subscription models. Um, I think the cheapest is 60 per year or something around that. And it goes up for there depending on how, how many videos and the sizes of the videos that you wanna do. So personally, I don't use Vimeo, but a lot of people do. And it would also store your videos. You just might have to pay a fee if you're doing a lot of large videos. And then the another hosting option is Screencast-O-Matic. Um, so I remember I talked a little bit more uh, earlier about screencasting, and that's gonna be a software that's just going to record exactly what's on your screen. So this can be really useful when you're trying to walk students through the steps of how to do something in your shell, or maybe to show them, for instance, for me as an English teacher, how to show them how to do research in your library's databases. Um, and with a pro account, you can both record video on your personal computer, but then you can actually upload the video to your cloud. So the Screencast-O-Matic website does have a cloud account. Um, I know that we have some Screencast-O-Matic options available to us um, through the district. So if this is something you're interested in, it, before you pay, I would check with your IT office to see if you can get a pro membership for free. Okay, good. And Joni said, um, Screencast-O-Matic is fantastic for how-to videos. Great. Yes. And then you could absolutely also save them on an external hard drive. So if you have one of those and you have the space, that can be another great way to do it. Okay. So transitioning for a moment, we after we think about where we're going to place our videos, where we're going to save them. And like I said, Canvas Studio is an option. Um, it's just a matter of whether we'll maintain our relationship with that, uh, with Canvas Studio after two years. Um, but after you do that, next you have to think about captioning. And you may have caught in the beginning of the training um, that little piece of the law that I read to you from section 508, that captions can be either closed or open. So closed captions are usually the ones we're most familiar with. They're the ones that you know, you'll see on your TV, you'll see on Netflix, you'll see on Disney Plus. And you'll usually see something that looks just like this, the double CC, and you, that you can toggle on and off. And these captions are added to video to ensure that all the auditory material, including music and sounds, are perceivable to someone who is hearing impaired. So if you've ever watched a show with closed captions, which I imagine many of you have at one time or another, you'll notice it's not just what the speakers are saying. It might be something like door slams, alarm goes off, any sound that a person who is hearing impaired might miss. And of course, the main feature that makes them uh, closed versus open is that they can be turned on and off. Um, and usually it's just a click away. Um, you, you'll see a double CC, click it on, click it off. There's also something called open captions, and those are actually considered burned in. In other words, they're part of the video and they cannot be turned off. So there is no toggling on or off, no matter uh, how you watch something with open captions, the captions are always there. So you might be wondering, well, which type should I use with my videos? So in legally, according to Section 508, either type of caption is fine. But closed captioning is recommended. And it's kind of for a simple reason if you think about it, which is that some of our students are auditory learners. Um, and, or they may find captions distracting. So. It, with closed captioning, they can actually turn the captions off if they just want to use sort of the auditory part of their brain to absorb the materials. So because our students all have different modes of learning and ways that they learn, allowing them to toggle the captions on and off gives sort of the most flexibility to all of our learners.
So who benefits from captions? I mean, the obvious answer is a student with a hearing impairment, but closed captions actually benefit more students than you would think. So thinking back to our very first training, if you were here when we were talking about curb cuts and Jack Fisher, the man who suggested curb cuts for disabled veterans, and then it was became a model all over the world. Um, a lot of times the changes we make for a, a person with a disability becomes useful to other people as well. And, and captions are a great example. So in a recent study, researchers discovered that 75% of students use captions. So three out of four, that's a lot. And that over a third use captions frequently. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, that number is really high. That's a lot higher than the number of students with, with hearing disabilities in my class. Well, and that's true because a lot of students besides those with disabilities are actually using captions. So for example, of course, they help students who are deaf or hard of hearing, but they also help students who are listening or viewing your video in a public place. It also helps students who are listening or viewing your video at work. And finally, captions can help with studying. So if I'm trying to learn unfamiliar terms, seeing it written out can be really helpful. Imagine also if I'm an English language learner and English is my second or third language. I have a student this semester where English is her fifth language. She is amazing, but those captions help her really sort of solidify written English in her own brain. They're very helpful to her. So all of these students are benefiting. And I think something to kind of remember too is that in our particular district, LACCD, 69% of our students are low income and one out of five are homeless according to our most recent surveys. So if you think about that for a minute, you may have students that are trying to view your video in a homeless shelter. Um, you may have students who the only time they get strong Wi-Fi is at work and they have to watch your video on a break. Um, we have to remember that our students may have difficult situations and captions are also going to help those students as well. So here are a couple of basic guidelines for captioning. Goals that you should have when you work on captions for your own videos. So the captioning must be complete. This means the video needs to be captioned from start to finish. Nothing should be left out. If there are background noises like a door slamming or you know a, a song coming on, things like that, that needs to be captured in your caption. Um, that way, that's the only way that a deaf or hard of hearing student or someone who's you know maybe in a shelter and can't listen to it out loud is gonna be able to know what's going on. So you need to try to be as complete as possible. Next, the caption should be 99% accurate. I know this is a little bit intimidating and it can be a little bit of work, but here's the thing. Your students are learning from your captions. When you think about the fact that one out of three of your students are using captions regularly, you don't want your captions to be full of errors, right? You don't want it to misspell important terms um, you also don't want to leave out grammar and punctuation, um, first of all, because a student who is hard of hearing is most likely going to use American Sign Language, and American Sign Language, ASL, is structured, the sentence is structured differently than written English. So seeing the proper punctuation, grammar, capitalization, that helps uh, a deaf or hard of hearing student master uh, written English. Same thing for an English language learner you're reinforcing proper grammar and punctuation when they're used. So you also want the captions to display synchronously. So with the audio, so you don't want the captions to be much slower than what's being actually spoken or much faster because that's gonna be distracting and it's gonna be confusing. You also wanna make sure your captions are on screen for an adequate amount of time um, otherwise they won't be readable. So there has to be enough time for a person to read them. And finally, you wanna think about caption placement. Um, usually they appear at the bottom, 
but this could be an issue if you have something at the bottom of the screen that students really need to see. So just make sure that your captions aren't obscuring other important information. Um, and Eugene, I'll talk to you a little bit later about how to make sure they're accurate. So we're gonna use a couple of tools to sort of help us get there. Now you may think, especially let's say if you make a video af off of a script, you might think to yourself, well, a transcript should be enough. I'll just post the video and I'll post the transcript. But transcripts alone are not sufficient for video. And think about, for example, if you were watching a cooking video and the transcript said something like, never mix these two ingredients. If that wasn't matched up to the pictures and sound, as a viewer, you would not have no idea what two ingredients not to mix. So you, you need not just a transcript. If there's video and sound, picture and sound, you're going to actually need captions. However, if it's something like a podcast, there's audio only, there's no picture, then a transcript is going to be okay. Now, there are a couple of captioning exceptions, which are important to know. And the first is raw footage. So raw footage is considered exempt from this law. And it is defined as materials that are for a single restricted use and are not archived. So for example, when I lead a Zoom class with my students, I don't have an interpreter in there, it, you know, writing perfect captions for everything that I say but it's considered raw footage. So it's not being used for future semesters. It's just in the moment capturing the raw footage in case students need it. So if you have a video that you are not planning to use again, it's sort of a one-time single restricted use, then you can uh, get away with not having captions. Another example of a captioning exception is feedback to students. So we can in Canvas, instead of leaving written comments to feedback or written comments to students, we can leave a video comment. And if you do that, that's considered raw footage. It's not for multiple people. It's just for that one student for that one time. However, you do wanna keep in mind, like I said a little bit ago, that students are not required to self-identify as hearing impaired. So as a best practice, if you're gonna leave video comments, you want to give your students an opportunity to let you know if they would prefer written feedback. So I had a recent at one class, my humanizing class used video feedback. And at the very beginning, the instructors had a very simple survey that asked, are you okay with video feedback or would you prefer written feedback? And that's just a way to address in case you have a hearing impaired student who hasn't identified themselves to you. Another sort of issue that I would just sort of like to bring up is that subtitles are different than captions. So think about showing a foreign film in your, in your class. If you turn on subtitles, your students will be able to see everything that's said, all the speech, but subtitles are different than captions because they don't describe the other sounds that are happening. They don't describe slamming doors, barking dogs, laughters, gunshots, all kinds of things that might be really important to understanding what's happening in the film. So, make sure that you aren't just turning on subtitles because you're missing information for your students who are hearing impaired. And um, if that is your uh, case where you have a subtitled foreign film, I would just recommend meeting with someone in your DSPS office virtually and kind of discussing uh, the issue and see if they have a solution for you. So another best practice when it comes to this is to remind your students that you do have captions. So just like on your television, captions must be turned on to be visible. And if your students are not aware that all your videos are captions, they may not even realize that they have the option to or opportunity to turn those captions on. 
So if you have numerous videos, consider a notice in your syllabus that all videos are captioned. And you can also remind them when you're introducing the video that it is captioned. That just gives them a little bit of a heads up, reminds them that they can do that. So preparing to caption. There are two main approaches for how you can do captions for a video you've created yourself. The first we talked about a little bit ago, which is that you can create a script. So you may sound a little bit more scripted or canned with a script, but if you have the script, then you can upload it to wherever you're hosting. And then those words are already there uh, and ready to be captured and to attach to what you've said. So if you have a script, the words are already there and that makes captioning a lot easier. However, you know, I also do videos that are not scripted and those can feel a lot more natural, which can be nice. Sometimes I ramble a little bit, but students can enjoy those as well. Um, the only downside or one of the downsides, I guess, is that you have to spend a little bit more time transcribing your video. So if you're just talking off the cuff and recording yourself for two minutes or something like that, then you're gonna have to go back and actually try to caption what you said um, by listening to it again. And we'll be able to use a few other tools potentially, but it will take a little bit more time to transcribe uh, what you've said if it's off the cuff. So where can you get help with captioning? Because wow, it can take a long time, right? So there's a couple places that you can get help. So the first is YouTube, and this is one of the reasons I prefer to use them for hosting my own videos. Um, they're going to do something called auto captioning. They are going, a computer is basically going to listen to your audio and try to translate it into words. Now, it's not gonna be completely accurate as you might imagine because it's being done by a computer. However, you can start with the auto captions and then correct them. So we'll watch a little bit of a video later in the presentation about how to do that. And yes, we'll talk about 3C Media in a second, Jose. Um, and then if you used a script, you can upload that script and just make sure that the time settings match where the captions are going. You can also use 3C Media. So this is great for when you're producing your own video. So like I mentioned earlier, they're not gonna caption videos that you have purchased, rented, or curated from others. But if you've made your own instructional video, you can request archiving and captioning through 3C Media Services. And I would say just in sort of my interactions with different faculty that are thinking about this or making videos, it's about half and half. Um, some are using YouTube, some are using 3C Media. I would say try both of them and maybe see which one you like best because both of them will do hosting and captioning. The difference is that 3C Media Services is going to do an exact caption for you. Um, there may be a little bit of a lag time though while they do that. And then YouTube is gonna do the auto captioning. Usually for me, it's within 30 minutes and then I just have to go in quickly and tweak it. Um, and then when I give you the presentation, I have linked this here so that you can, you can um, visit the page and look a little bit more. Now there's another option, and this is especially important if you need to caption a video that you didn't create yourself. And that's the DECT grant, D-E-C-T, which is an acronym for the Distance Education Captioning and Transcription Grant. Again, this is funded by the Chancellor's Office to promote faculty innovation in the use of audio, video, and multimedia content in distance learning classes. Um, long story short, um, this grant will help pay for you to get captioning on a video that you didn't create yourself. So for instance, I have in the past found a really great YouTube video on a grammar topic that's very difficult to understand, but it doesn't have captions and I don't own it. So um, what I've done is working with my local GSPS team, um, particularly on our campus, Adrian uh, Gonzalez does a lot of work with the DECT grant. 
um, we, I can ask for a professional transcription company to make a transcription uh, for me, and then it will be covered by the grant. Now there is a little bit of a pa of paperwork and it can take a little bit of time. You also probably, unless your school campus has a really sort of um, different uh, method of doing this than ours, you probably can't do it all by yourself. You're probably gonna need to work with someone. But um, once you do this, this is a really good way to get a vendor to help you. So I know recently I was talking to a faculty member here who had, um, he, he teaches in the administration of justice and he has some videos about, you know, something like arrests or, you know, you know, interviews in, inside the, the police department that he likes the students to watch. Well, he didn't create it, so he can't send it to three, you know, three CS. He doesn't own the rights, so he can't upload it to YouTube like it's his own. So what he would need to do is work with Adrian um, to get the DECT grant to pay for an outside company to do it. Um, and let's see, okay, I'm just looking at your question, Jose. How can we download a caption video from YouTube? I'm gonna show you how to do a search just for YouTube videos with captions. So that's why in the past I used to just, let's say I wanted to find a video on subject verb agreement. I would just put that into YouTube, try to find the best thing without filtering whether it was captioned or not. But now because the DECT grant is cumbersome, it's useful, but it can take a minute, right? So I more often look for grant for videos that already have captions. So I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. But can I say uh, something? Uh, yes, Dr. please Trent? go ahead, Adrian. Um, many times faculty like to use what's available on YouTube. And a lot of the times uh, they, they wonder, you know, if the caption is, you know, properly done or, or however, right? But this, once you go to the process of the debt grant, uh, you know, um, the vendor, whoever does the captioning, it will, it will be done professional, but also what they would do is create a layer over the video. So uh, they're not messing with the owner of the video. And so that helps a lot. Uh, you know, it doesn't delay any time because usually in the past, Many years ago, we will have to ask the owner of the creator of the video uh, and for permission to use it for, you know, for a class. But now that's no longer the case because the vendor has the, a way to create a layer over the, the video and the closed caption is being uh, offered there. Absolutely. Thank you, Adrian. And that's a really great way to work around copyright issues if you don't own the video yourself. Okay. Another program that was brought up in my at one course when I took this is something called Amara. And it, I haven't used it personally, but it's, it's kind of like crowdsourcing your captions. It has some auto capture software, um, but if you wanna do captions in other languages too, even, it can help you with that. So there's just a quick, uh, I think it's less than a minute video. So I'm just gonna show you um, this too. So hold on. Amara makes video globally accessible with captions and translations. It was designed with three audiences in mind. First, if you're a video creator, Amara can help you make subtitles with the easiest to learn software in the world. It's collaborative, like Wikipedia, so you can invite friends and audience members to help out. Second, if you're passionate about accessibility, like we are, you can join one of dozens of communities on Amara that do things like caption videos for deaf and hard of hearing users and translate videos into dozens of languages. Third, if you're working with video and need professional grade tools or on-demand subtitles, Amara can help. So, whether you're an individual, a community member, or an organization using Amara, you are supporting Amara's mission to ensure that everyone has access.
Karen, you are muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, Zoom is does not provide closed captions to answer Nadra's question. Um, it will provide auto generated captions. So if you want to keep your Zoom presentation and use it multiple years versus the raw footage exception that I was talking about earlier, if you plan to keep it and reuse it, you're going to need to go in and fix the auto captions because it's just going to be a computer listening to the audio. So it's going to make mistakes. Um, okay, and then it's uh, Michelle says Zoom and Studio and Canvas has transcription with auto captioning that you can correct and PowerPoint does too in VidGrid. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, Michelle also said um, in your Zoom pro profile under setting, uh, click recording and then scroll down to audio transcript and then you can make edits. Um, perfect to the audio transcript. Absolutely. So luckily, I mean, the... So Software and technology has come a long way. And we're kind of lucky that this pandemic hit at a time when technology is really, there's a lot of cool technology there to support um, individuals with disabilities or other needs. Um, right. Amara right. makes video globally. Um, so there is a lot there. There is still some work to be done, but we basically have a lot of support. Um, so now let's talk for a second about auto captioning because obviously we're getting auto captions. We're getting them from YouTube. We're getting them from Canvas Studio. We're getting them from Zoom, right? And uh, you may be tempted to think mm, close enough, right? Close enough. And especially if you're very good at articulating, so you really pronunciate, that's going to help the auto captioning software. Because if you mumble, it's going to be terrible. But if you talk very clearly, there's a better chance that it's going to get close to what you said. But th this isn't close enough, right? Because there's still going to be errors. It's I don't think I've ever seen an auto caption do capture me, even if I'm enunciating like, you know, Liza Doolittle, I'm still gonna not get a perfect uh, script. And you don't want key information, key words, terms that your students are already working so hard to learn. You don't want to get those wrong. And then in addition, like I mentioned earlier, you're most likely not gonna have proper punctuation and capitalization, things that are really gonna help your students who are hard of hearing and use American Sign Language or your English language learners who are watching the captions to learn written English. So you really have to go a little bit further than auto captioning. So I want to show you uh, a video that we watched in my at one class. And this just kind of demonstrates a caption fail and how the, this there is sort of this mismatch. Now, one thing I'm gonna show you in the very beginning before they even get into their little project that they did to test the auto captioning, they didn't caption the first part. And you'll notice, I'll turn the captions on so you can see it, that the first part of the video is actually auto captioned. And you're gonna notice if you're kind of listening and reading along, that there's going to be some errors there. Um, but then you're going to see how they sort of got into this testing the, the um, auto captioning and sort of the, the huge margin for error that there can be. You might have seen that a lot of YouTube videos have this closed caption option now where you can click the little CC button and it'll display text on the screen for what's being said in the video. The whole process is automated. A computer listens to the video and displays what it thinks it hears. So the results are always off and usually pretty hilarious. So we had this idea to play telephone with YouTube transcriptions. We wrote a script, filmed it, and uploaded the video to YouTube. Then we downloaded the computer's transcript and used that as our script for round two. Then we uploaded that to YouTube to get another script, which became round three. We've included the text on the screen to make it easier to understand what we're saying. Enjoy. Okay, I'm just gonna stop here for a second. We're gonna continue watching, but I wanted you to see what the auto captions look like. You can tell there's no end punctuation, there's no capitalization, there's no commas, and there's some errors. And usually you'll see it at the very beginning when you start to play. Let me see if it'll come up again. 
You might have seen that a lot of YouTube videos have this closed caption option now. Um, I don't know if you were able to see that, but when I first turned on closed captioning, it said English, and then in parentheses, it said auto captioning. So that lets you know right away that a video hasn't been captioned properly. And then you could see that there wasn't any punctuation, anything like that. But now we're gonna get into their actual exercise, which is what I wanted you to see. So here we go. Enjoy. Hey man. Hey, I've been trying to read you for the past hour. What have you been doing? Oh, nothing. I was just polishing my Little League MVP trophy. Is that a euphemism for something? Uh, no. What are you eating? A 100% organic, free-range black bean vegan burrito. How can a black bean be free-range? I don't know. Google it. You'll never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. Uh, an iPhone? I got tickets to the Lady Gaga Putt Putt Tournament of Monster Truck Rally. With the opening act, Little People with Piercings? Yes. I can't believe it. You're my best friend, man. When do we go? Actually, I'm not taking you. I'm taking Elise, my eight-year-old niece. You mean the niece has been trapped in that goat cheese making cult in southern Venezuela? Well, it's a llama butter making cult in South Carolina, but yeah. Well, next time you want to call me and not invite me to something, then just don't call me at all. Well, next time you don't want to be happy for me when my niece is released from a cult and gets to go with me to an amazing concert, don't answer your phone. Fine. Fine. Hey, man. Anytime we put that style, what you been doing? Well, nothing, which is polishing my Little League MVP traffic. Resenting you for missing to something? No. What are you eating? Or 100% organic, free range, but the Indian retail. Part of my baby free range. Parallel to collect. Never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. Marathon. Advantages to the Lady Gaga puppet to name us a drug right. Would the opening at Little People would be a sensor? U.S. But do you believe it? Your best friend. When we get? Actually, I'm not taking it to get at least nine-year-old niece. You mean he's been trapped in a goat cheese making calls a network? Was a lot about meeting. Construct a line of the year. Without anyone calm united by minister to the so-called me at all. Well, next time you don't want to be happy for me, woman eases release from a cotton disability to an amazing concert donating your poem. Five. Five. Hey, man. Any time, but that's how we've handled one. I think what you're talking about, the legality traffic. Resenting your permissiveness something? No. What are you reading? Oracle Organic Free Range, but being in retail. Part of a difference free range? Parallel to collect. Never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. Marathon. Advantages of the Lady Gaga puppets and a lot of Iraq. With the other email, it would be a sense that? You pets! But it was a bit. Your best friend. When we get. Action not taking a dig, at least nine-year-old niece. You mean he's been trapped in a goat cheese making calls a network. Was a lot about meeting, construct a line in the year. Without anyone called, united by minister to the so-called me at all. Well, next time you know one of the happy for me at a news release from a cotton, this ability to an amazing concert, donating your poll. Fact. Facts. You still there? Okay, so that video is just sort of a representation of what can happen with auto captioning. So, you know, they said the first part and then the computer picked up a totally different thing that it then ca captioned and that they read aloud on the second one. Um, and so you can see auto captioning can be not only very inaccurate, but it can also be confusing. So that's why we need to take the time to correct it. Otherwise, the right material isn't going to be there. Oh, okay, so how to edit your auto captions on YouTube. Um, since that's where I know a lot of us are doing it, I want to show you a brief video. It's under two minutes and it's going to show you exactly how to fix your auto captions on YouTube. This video walks you through the steps to edit auto captions on a video in YouTube. First, go to youtube.com and be sure that you're signed in by checking to see if you see your photo in the upper right corner. Once you're signed in, click on your profile photo and go to YouTube Studio. On the left side of the screen under your channel, select videos. Click on the video that you'd like to caption. This opens the video details page. On the left side of the screen, under your video, select subtitles. 
On the video subtitles page, you'll see the words English, assuming that your video is set to an English language by default, and automatic in parentheses. That means that the auto captions have been enabled for that video. Place your mouse over that row and you'll see three dots appear that are the options feature and select there. Now click on edit on Classic Studio. And this is going to open the captioning editor over in the old YouTube interface, which has not yet quite been moved over to the new YouTube studio. That was the hardest part, I promise. What you're going to do from here is click on edit. And now you'll see that all the captions over on the left are editable. What you'll want to do is go through the captions and add capitals and commas and periods and correct spelling errors. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. When you're all done, click the blue Publish Edits button in the upper right corner. Now what you're going to see is that you have two published caption tracks. One is the original automatic, which is the auto captions, and the second one that doesn't have the word automatic in it is your edited track. What you'll want to do is delete the automatic track to be sure that the edited one actually appears when your video is viewed. To do that, click again on the automatic track. Now you'll know you're in the automatic track because when you look over at the left, you'll see that nothing's capitalized, there's no commas, right? This is where we started. So what I'm going to do now is click on Unpublish in the upper right corner. And finally, select Delete Draft. That will get rid of the auto caption track. And if you're prompted again, select Delete Draft. Now the only remaining track is the one that you edited and we can test that out by clicking play and turning on the closed captions and you'll see that the captions are now accurate. Good job. This video walks you through the Karen, same problem. <laughs> sorry, it has been such a long year. I am having trouble with the unmuting. Um, sorry about that. So I was just saying that um, that's an overview for how to do it on YouTube. If you're using auto captioning somewhere else, there's probably already multiple YouTube videos or other videos about how to auto caption. So just Google how to fix auto captions in Zoom, how to fix auto captions in Canvas Studio or whichever one you're doing. And you should be able to find guidance step-by-step -step about how to do it. Now, in terms of best practice, another thing that I personally have been working on when I use video in my classroom is providing context. So with Canvas, it's really easy to just sort of drop a URL and have it be there without any other information. And personally, this is how I used to use video in my online class. But think about it in terms of a face-to-face -face class. How strange would it be as a student to walk into your face-to-face -face class, have your teacher turn on a video, watch the video in absolute silence, then as a teacher turn off the video and without, without another word, dismiss the class. So when we're using video, sort of a best practice is also contextualizing it for students, letting them know why they're watching it, what they're looking for, what you'd like them to think about as they watch it. So that's something that I've also been working on is not our only creating sort of well captioned, well lit videos that are easily perceived by everyone, but embedding them on a page where there are some introductions like, hey students, this video connects to what we've been talking about with strong academic writing. As you listen, I'd like you to take notes and jot down any questions you have for me in our next Zoom session. That's just off the top of my head, but that's an example of a set of instructions you could give for a video. Now, when it goes to actually embedding your video into a page, 
Now, like I said, in, in, the, in the old days of me using Canvas, I used to just add the URL. <clears throat> but now that I know better, I put it on a page where there's some instructions before. When I go to embed a video, there's two different ways. If it is a YouTube URL, what will happen is Canvas will recognize it's a video, a YouTube video, and it'll basically provide a thumbnail. And I couldn't get the whole thing to fit, but I, I copy and pasted what somebody had posted in my humanizing class. And you can see the text is, is a lot longer out to the margin. And then there's just a little bit of a thumbnail of a YouTube video. Now, if you're new to this, the nice thing is it does automatically generate this through the YouTube widget. And all you have to do is copy and paste in um, the URL from the video, either from the browser address, or if you click share on YouTube, the URL will come up. But there is a downside to this, and that's that it will appear smaller than when you're using the embedded feature. So I was telling you, I'm currently finishing up the humanizing course. And one of the things they recommended is actually manually embedding videos because it will appear bigger to the students and it will fill their screen more easily. So just to show you an example, so that was from a discussion in humanizing what I showed you. Here's an example from a discussion where the video was manually embedded. And if you're using the rich content editor, there is a specific way to embed video. And when you go to um, a YouTube or a Vimeo or one of these other places and you click share, a lot of times you'll be able to toggle to something called an embed code. Um, once you copy and paste that in, you can see the video actually goes all the way out to the margin. And so this is an example from a discussion, but the person who wrote this, you can see their video fills the whole screen. It looks really nice and it looks really clean. So personally for me, when I use video now, I no longer drop it with just a URL. I put it in a page that's accessible, I introduce it, and then I do the manual embed so that it looks really nice on their screen. And I've included some links here in the, the presentation, which I also just posted in chat that you can click on if you need some more assistance with us. Okay, so Retrofitting video is an important topic because you probably have videos in your past that you've already used. It's sometimes also known as remediation. You're doing an accessibility remediation of materials you already have. So don't panic. It is a little intimidating at first, but the very first thing you should do is look to see if the videos you've been using have real captions. Remember, not auto captions. We're not looking for captions that have no capitals, no punctuation, that say auto-generated with lots of errors. Look to see if there are real captions with punctuation, capitalization, all the things that students need to properly absorb the material. If you find that you have videos that are not properly captioned or the captions are inaccurate, now you're gonna take a further step depending on where your video is hosted. So um, what you can do, like I was saying earlier, is you can go in and you can change the captioning, or maybe you decide, look, this video wasn't that great to begin with. Why don't I find a different video that's properly captioned on the same topic? And for me, I would say that most of the time um, when I find a resource that's been auto-generated, I can find something similar that already has proper captions. If I can't find something similar, remember we have that DECT grant, we have the other options, you can change the auto captions. But another option is, hey, I don't love this video anyway, let me get rid of it and find something similar that's already properly captioned. So if you're looking for to curate accessible multimedia, one place you can look is your campus library. So um, there's definitely been a shift um, in things going more online even before COVID in terms of our libraries. So it's a good idea to talk to your librarian about streaming video collections. They might have a film on demand or you know, a little learning video that's already properly captioned that you can just slip in in place of this older video that wasn't captioned. Another place that you can look that I personally love is TED Talks. 
So if you've never watched a TED Talk, they're great. They're inspiring. They're really well created. And they're all always captioned properly. And they have time stamped transcripts. So a person can just read the transcript back to keep learning. They're really engaging. I tend to put a lot of them into my classes. The one thing you need to watch out for is that there's something called TEDx speeches. And these are independent events that are affiliated with TED Talks, but they may not be captioned. So you don't want to find any random TED Talk on YouTube and assume that it's properly captioned. You should always check. Personally, I can usually tell in a very short amount of time, maybe 20 to 30 seconds of watching the captions, whether or not it's auto-generated or correct based on whether I see punctuation marks and capital letters. Um, but the other thing that I would recommend is if you are gonna use TED Talks, instead of using the TED Talk on YouTube, link directly to the TED Talk website itself because they're gonna have all kinds of things there, resources for students that they're not gonna see on YouTube. So if you're looking for high quality, accessible media, check out TED Talks. And there's also, I, I know for me as an English teacher, they have um, educational TED Talks now that are on YouTube as well that are properly captioned that teach students about writing and grammar and other things that are useful. So I would recommend that if you're looking for accessible media. Another place to look is YouTube. So. YouTube has all kinds of really phenomenal things on it, and some of them are already properly captioned, but you need to be discerning because the quality of YouTube videos varies very widely. And sometimes when you hit caption, see that CC, what you see is auto-generated and something with no capital letters, no punctuation. That's not properly captioned. So you want to really be discerning and choose something that has a high production quality, the sound is good, the visual is good, and the captions are correct. So quickly to address something that was asked earlier, and I hope that this is the question that you were, you were asking, is how do I find closed caption videos on YouTube? Because I do like finding new videos for my students, but I don't want to search through, find the perfect video, and then realize it's not closed captioned. Luckily, there is a way to just search for videos that have proper closed captioning. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. I think this is about a minute long. Videos with captions available will have a CC icon underneath the video summary in the search results. If you'd like the search results to only show videos with captions available, enable this search filter. Enter your keywords in the YouTube search bar. Click the Filters button. Click Subtitles slash CC. You may also search by entering your keywords in the YouTube search bar and add a comma CC at the end. Be sure to manually check the video for subtitle accuracy before you add it to your course. Please note that YouTube's auto-generated captions do not meet accessibility guidelines. There are several YouTube channels that have already captioned academic content, such as Crash Course, Khan Academy, and TED. Once you have found a video you'd like to use, you may capture the embed code under Share and Embed. Okay, so that just kind of gave you a brief overview of how you can search just for closed caption videos. And then it also gave you a hint about how to get that embed code by showing you that. Okay. There are also a ton of places that make videos with captioning. And I think with everything that's happened with COVID, this is becoming a regular conversation for people, which is really exciting in a way that I feel like it wasn't 
as much of a conversation pre-COVID. It's always been the law, but I feel like people are kind of coming around. So more and more um, video producers and channels are offering educational resources with perfect captioning, which makes our lives a lot easier um, when we want to find a video that we don't want to produce ourselves. So I've linked just a couple of resources here that, that do that. But besides TED Talks, there's also the History Channel, Khan Academy, National Geographic Education, Discovery Education, PBS Learning Media, and Edutopia. So luckily for us, if we don't have the free time to create all these perfect captions for things, there are already so many places out there that are doing that. And that makes our lives as instructors a little bit easier. Um, another thing that I would recommend is a, a webinar um, through at one that I'll show you in a minute. And one thing that I would just remind you is that you may feel a little intimidated about using video after this presentation, but just remember it's a really powerful tools and there's big payoffs and how much our students retain and understand and the interests that they have. Um, also, I know that in 2020, sometimes some of us feel camera shy, but you know, creating a video doesn't have to be super labor intensive. There are ways that you can make it easier. Um, and if you are someone who wants to learn more about screencasting, oh, I have a typo, sorry about that. Um, the, there is a self-paced tutorial that At One did on Screencast-O-Matic that you can watch. And that way, that's like I was telling you, that's when you show your screen. You don't have to worry about lighting. You only have to worry about audio as you're talking over your screencast and then captioning um, your audio afterwards. So I'm not going to show this to you because it's, I, it's long, but this is a one hour webinar that you can watch um, that will teach you all about how to use Screencast-O-Matic. So if you're feeling camera shy, but you still want to humanize your class, this is a great way to do it. Show them how to do things in your shell and um, they'll still hear your voice, which will help them feel connected to you, which is really important. And then the other thing, hold on, that I have been loving in my humanizing class is something called, something, 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 something. oh, sorry, okay. Something called Adobe Spark. Um, I'd never used it before, but basically you can pick uh, royalty free pictures and videos and put text over them. And they're really engaging videos. So this is another thing I do if I want to reach out to my students, but I don't want them to see my face because it's 2020 and I'm eating pizza at one in the morning sometimes and you know, whatever, right? I don't always want to be on camera, but with Adobe Spark, you can pull royalty free videos and images and then just talk over them. And then all you have to do is caption that little bit of audio. You can use the, you know, upload it to YouTube. It's really simple, easy to use. I was able to get um, a free account with my .edu email. Um, and if you need uh, royalty free images and videos, I recommend Unsplash and Pexels. Um, Unsplash I use mostly for images, Pexels I use for royalty free video and images. And so all of these things can bring your class to life and you don't even have to be on camera. You just need to worry about your audio and some great captioning. And believe me, your students are gonna appreciate it because they feel isolated. Who doesn't? It's a hard year. And hearing your voice is gonna mean a lot to them. So thank you everyone for the kind words. Just kind of wrapping up here in this training, my goal was that you would be able to assess the production quality of a video, caption a video, curate video resources and embed a video in a canvas page. It's a continual learning process, but hopefully you feel a little bit more confident about those things. And um, I'd like to thank you again for coming. Um, I'd like to direct you briefly to the chat before I take questions. Um, I have put in the full presentation for you. And I also have put in a link to the LACCD faculty Canvas site, specifically our, our page here at LA Mission College. I'm really proud of our team. We're really trying to pound the pavement about accessibility, get people excited and universal design and realizing what's, what is out there and how we can reach all of our students. So I put the link to that page. 
uh, in the chat. So feel free to check it out. Um, I'm sure probably by tomorrow or the next day, this video will be up along with the presentation. Um, if you're a mission person, it'll probably be up in the FLC in the next few hours. So thank you so much for coming. Big thank you. I know it's a really, really intense time of year and you have put your students needs first to come here. So thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. One final ask that I have is that if you have a name